Hey, Anthony, do you think that whenever Bowser's septic system goes on the fritz, he swallows his pride and calls Mario? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Anne Mirth. Thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first time, well, I'd like to tell you that we're gonna be working our way through the Savoy cocktail book, all 750 recipes. If you're coming back to join us again, thank you so, so much. We appreciate it a lot. And if you haven't already, please subscribe below. So our board game of the week this week is Betrayal at the House on the Hill. And we also made our next set of cocktails, which is the Alexander number one, Alexander number two, and Alexander's sister. So a little family tryst going on there. Uh, aside from playing Betrayal, we also had a little bit of extra time this week and we played a tabletop RPG. And I've been dreading that that's terrible. I'm so sorry. I we played Dread, which is a tabletop RPG by the Impossible Dream Studios. And you use a Jenga tower for any of the things that your character your player characters are trying to do. So, like, you know, let's say somebody gets injured and somebody's trying to help them, they have to pull from the Jenga tower. So what happens is as the tensions build in the game, the tower gets more rickety. If the tower collapses, that character dies. So it's a really cool handshake between this like building tension of the physical tower and the actual storytelling. And I really, really enjoyed it. I particularly enjoyed uh, bringing my character, Barbara, the best friend sort of archetype in the game of like a horror story uh, to life and uh, possibly to her inevitable death. The, the tower is sort of becoming more and more deteriorating as the st story gets more and more tense is you just, you feel that tension every time and you have so little control over what's happening to the tower because other people have to also do actions. And so you get to points in there where, you know, is 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 it worthwhile to do anything because you could possibly die? Uh, I, I found that very interesting mechanic. Unfortunately for me, probably fortunately for you guys, I was only able to kill off one of the player characters. And it was actually because she had sacrificed herself by uh, purposefully toppling the tower to take out the big bad which was a really satisfying end to our little story and was, you know, it, it was a nice wrap up for our game. Moving on to our game of the week, Betrayal. It's a game that I really liked playing the first time we did it, but I feel like every time we go back, I like it just a little bit less. It's somewhere in between a role playing game and a, a classic dungeon crawl, but I just don't feel like it's successful at either of them. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say about it. So why don't we go into our first cocktail? Sounds good. So for our first cocktail, we have the Alexander number one. In this cocktail, you'll start by mixing one and a half ounces of dry gin, three quarter ounces of creme de cacao, and three quarter ounces of sweet cream. You will shake and strain this into a cocktail glass, getting you something that looks like this drink. Alrighty, so, you know, week by week, and it's seemingly gonna try a bunch of gin cocktails, but I think we're getting closer to gin cocktails I'll enjoy. It's still a little sharp for me on top of this, but I think with that creme de cacao and the cream in there, it really cuts a lot of that and makes it a lot smoother overall. So I would drink this, yes. I don't know if I would necessarily stock up for, or, you know, order a bunch of them, but I would drink this. <laughs> Bring that sharpness on. I like it. I like the heat that you get from it. It's almost um, the way that the gin and the creme de cacao sort of combine together. It's almost like a coffee profile with that sharpness coming on top. And then the cream, as you were saying, it gives you a really nice mouthfeel that's just smooth. I, I'm not going to chug a bunch of them. I don't think that my stomach could handle that <laughs> in my elderly age, but um it, it is something that I would enjoy sipping on occasion. So, Betrayal at the House on the Hill is a game meant for three to six players, ages 12 plus, by Avalon Hills. There's currently one expansion available, which is called Widow's Walk. I find it really easy to teach to people, but your mileage may vary on that depending on how experienced your players are with board games in general. I really, really want to like this game a lot more than I do. The tone is so it's so eerie and like really kind of borderline spooky and scary. The art direction's really lovely and I like the models and all the houses and stuff, house pieces and stuff. It just, it just doesn't hit quite the right notes for me. Agreed. 
everything about me wants to enjoy the tone and this concept. You're these explorers in a creepy home and then suddenly there's a big twist and the, the game takes a whole haunt phase where you're supposed to, you know, worry about a traitor and all that stuff. And you would think that would really just like draw you in every time. But there's some things that just feel out of balance. Sometimes the haunt phase can come very quickly and no one's prepared for it and gets to kind of a lackluster end game. Also, similarly, the game could just draw on and on and on. Um, but there's just, we've only played through a handful of scenarios and there's so much to it that I, I feel like I want to keep going back because there's, there's going to be so many scenarios we can try. The completionist in me really wants to go back and play through all of the scenarios because there are a lot of them. And you among us would know best about what it's like to lead the heroes through that house one square at a time while they do one damage to you until it's like 2 a.m. Wouldn't you, Anthony? Okay, one time and I really wanted to win, so it was worth it. Aside from the layout of the house changing and the scenario changing every time you play, the character mats also have two options, which are like slightly statted differently for each player token, which should lend to even more difference every time you play to it. It just doesn't quite strike the right balance between exploring the house and the end game. Probably good to go ahead and te you know tell everybody about the rules so they can start to get a better idea of how that plays together. What's our second cocktail? All right, for our second drink, we have Alexander number two. Uh, for Alexander number two, we'll use one ounce of brandy, one ounce of creme de cacao, one ounce of fresh cream, which you'll shake and strain into a cocktail glass. And you should have something that looks like this drink. Wow, that okay. is delightful. That was delicious. Wow. Okay, so this brandy mixing with that creme de cacao, like all of that, uh, like brown sugary flavor mixing with the coffee. Oh, that is delightful. If the last one was like coffee based, this one is basically like adult chocolate milk. Very smooth, nice, well balanced, not too sweet. It's It would make a really good like uh, dessert drink. So if you're nomming on some cookies or something like that, it's a good, uh, it's a good adult chocolate milk to sort of sip along with that. Okay, let me tell you about the rules for Betrayal on the House on the Hill. This game starts as a cooperative exploration game. Players investigate the house by moving around and revealing room tiles. Rooms may have events, omens, or items which can hurt or help the discovering player. Anytime an omen card is read and revealed, the haunt tracker goes up one point, and a roll of six dice is made. If at any point the roll is below the current haunt track count, the haunt begins. At this point, the game becomes an asymmetric game where the traitor attempts to defeat the other players, depending on the scenario. The rest of the players work together to escape or foil the betrayer. And at this point, you also feel the tension rise in the table. You have now a, a scenario where the heroes and the traitor have to sort of come up with their game plan separately. There's two little booklets for each of them that they're going to read separately. The heroes will have their scenario on how to escape or how to foil the traitor, whereas the traitor is going to have how he either ends the hero's lives or t destroys the home or something. Uh, you could feel that tension build and then you end up uh, everybody coming back to the table with their secret goals and abilities and now they have to plan to outmaneuver each other because death is now a very real possibility where it wasn't in the exploration phase. And again, tonally, it all sounds so cool together. <clears throat> and with what you're talking about with the death, it's based on the stats of the player boards. On, on your player mat, you've got both mental and physical stats, two of each. If you, for whatever reason, due to events in rooms or from the trader giving you damage, uh, if you ever have to reduce one of those down to zero, your character dies. And then that's part of what this imbalance that we keep talking about is, uh, during the exploration phase, you can actually injure your character a bunch of times, but never die. And so if you get down to a really low point during the exploration phase, you're now at a point that you it's hard to make the rules to succeed at any challenges or even fend off a basic attack, making that last phase a little less satisfying than it could be. And I think we could probably talk about, you know, in general, the imbalance about it, but why don't we go ahead and dig a little bit deeper in our experience with the scenario we played uh, and give us that third drink. 
Third cocktail of this evening is the Alexander Sister. For the Alexander Sister, you'll start by mixing one ounce of gin, one ounce of creme de menthe, one ounce of cream, which you will then shake and strain into a cocktail glass. And you should end up with a drink that looks like this. Oh, wow. Uh, well, that uh, that is definitely like a candy cane in a cocktail. That is super sweet, uh, definitely up my alley. Uh, it has gin in it, could not tell for the life of me it does, so I think we have a winner for sure. Uh, I don't know if I could drink more than one, uh, and definitely not outside of the holidays, but I am thoroughly surprised. We've had three cream-based cocktails and I enjoyed pretty much all of them. Was not expecting that. The cream just makes them all so smooth. Like there is such a nice thickness to it too. Like we've talked about mouthfeel a couple of times, but it just, it it literally is the feeling that it is in your mouth. It has a nice texture to it because of the cream adding, just rounding out all of those things. And with this one, the creme de menthe is not overpowering at all. The peppermint comes through really nice and sweet without being cloying or overbearing. It's almost like a, um, like a little York mint, you know, like it just has the right balance of mint and sweetness that, uh, again, like just another really lovely dessert drink that I could uh, sip on after a really heavy dinner to sort of, you know, help everything settle. I feel like I'm harping on it just a little bit, but the character I was playing in our game of betrayal was Missy and her primary stat is speed. Like she's very good at moving through the rooms quickly. Unfortunately, during the exploration phase, I had taken a couple points of a physical damage, so her speed went down, making her a bit more challenging to just succeed at basic tasks. So whenever I turned into the traitor, it was, you know, it just, it sets up a, it sets up a thing where you feel very powerless to win, even though, you know, as the traitor, you get whatever uh, small advantages that it gives you. Missy still didn't have very many things to be able to accomplish the goal, making it feel like I spent the four or five rounds playing sort of just hitting my head against a wall that I was never going to accomplish. So it's sort of a, a slow drawn out death, which just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel very good as that person. It's true. Uh, we did triumph. We handily defeated you, but it, it was a bit of a hollow victory. You know, it, it's, it's just a sort of uh, defeating for the players, the heroes, because it's you can kind of tell it's inevitable. You, you were set up in a way that the trader didn't have much going for them and you were able to be in the right place at the right time or have the number advantage or whatever uh, ended up the way it was. So it's sort of just a drawn out ending of like, okay, I guess we're going to win. However, point is that I won this week, which means I will take this W, bringing us to a victory total of three for me, I believe. And I am excited to continue this domination of victories for our board game tallies. I don't think so. I watched through our last episode and that tally board said that it was two to Sarah, one to me, and zero to you. So I'm not sure where you're pulling the three from. And again, your wins are not her wins and her wins are not your win. I'm feeling a little bit fuzzy. My face is feeling flushed and my tummy is full. So I think that means we made it through another three cocktails and I think we're a little bit wiser for it. So why don't you tell the people at home what we're doing next week? Next week, we're gonna enjoy the board game Takedo, where we assume the role of travelers crossing the East Sea Road in Japan. Also, we'll be trying out the Alfonso, the Alfonso Special, and the Alice Mine Cocktail. We're glad you enjoyed the video. Let us know what you think and tell us how we can improve. You can do so by liking, commenting below, and subscribing to the channel so that you get alerts for whenever we have new media that you can consume. But actually though, do you think that Bowser even has the wherewithal to be like, oh, my plumbing's bad. Mario, please yeah, help. Know, I was thinking about it. I, it wouldn't Wario and Luigi.